but uh, but in a deed and truth, he has to say things like that. Don't just say you love a brother. Show that you love a brother. So you can imagine that the churches John wrote to were maybe filled with saints who were saying that they loved one another, but they weren't actually loving one another. Just think of that church situation. The saints are not actually loving one another in deed and truth. There are people teaching wrong things about Jesus Christ. And there are many antichrists, many people who are against uh, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And this was the situation that many churches were in at that time. So John had seen glory days. He had seen positive things. And John also saw challenges. And he saw hardships. Uh, he had seen brothers come and go. He had seen uh, all of his other companions, the, the other apostles. All of them had been martyred. And that began with his own flesh brother, James, in Jerusalem. And that's in the book of Acts. Church history tells us that all of the apostles, all of the 12 apostles, were all martyred in some way. And John was the last remaining apostle. So he had seen brothers come. He had seen brothers go. He had seen his companions take a strong stand for the Lord in such an encouraging way. And then he saw his companions die. And now John was left alone. And he was looking at the churches. He had seen hopeful churches. Probably he had seen hopeful churches collapse. He had seen hopeful situations disappear. And now he saw the churches were in a very hard struggle and challenge, dealing with so many things. And then what did John begin his first epistle with? It was this matter of fellowship. And uh, I'd like to just read these verses maybe in, in English. I'm glad that we read them before. But this is how John begins his epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, here it is, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete, or our joy may be made full. So John tells us in verse 3, that he tells us the, the, the reason of his proclaiming to his readers is so that they too would have fellowship with John and the rest of the apostles. And indeed, their fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And by writing these things, and by bringing the believers into fellowship with him and with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, John and the other apostles, their joy would be made full. It would be made complete. So the outcome of this was joy. You know, I talked a little bit about John's situation, but I want you to also think about your own situation and think about maybe even your own church's situation. Uh, you may be a very hopeful brother, you may have a lot of desire for the Lord. You may have a lot of love for the Lord. Or you may be a very hopeful sister. You may feel like, wow, I love the Lord so much and I just want to grow in the Lord. You know, John saw brothers and sisters just like you. Uh, you may be a brother or a sister who struggles with various things. You may be a brother or a sister who struggles just even with the matter of faith, with believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, you may struggle with understanding how certain things in the Christian life work. Or you may just struggle because you have there's a lot of things in the world 
that are very attractive to you, uh, whatever those things might be. If you're a little bit older, uh, you may really be attracted by working hard and accomplishing something in a worldly setting. You might be uh, attracted by something like money or something like fame, some kind of limited kind of glory uh, with, with man. If you're younger, you may uh, be attracted by good, have, getting good grades, being the top of your class, or uh, maybe having something that all of your friends uh, are, are envious of, or maybe even something just like playing video games uh, is something that fills up your time and takes away time from many other positive things. And you may say, what's the problem with that? Okay, I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying this might be your experience. Uh, or you may think about your church life. Your church life may be very hopeful, may be very full of life, full of joy, full of love. You know, the Apostle John saw churches just like that. Or you may think of your church life, and it may be very dull, may be very boring. It might be routine. It might feel religious. It might feel, you might wonder, how does this apply to my life? You know, John saw churches like that also. John saw, John's experience was not just of churches in his time, but actually, John saw all of us. He saw all of our situations, both the most positive and the most negative. He saw the, the, the biggest blessings that we experience. He saw the hardest challenges that we experience. He saw all the things that we face in our daily life, in our spiritual life, in our life in the world. And, uh, you know, John saw all of these things. The Apostle John saw you, and he saw your experiences, both in the world and in, and in the church. And the Apostle John wrote this, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You know, the Apostle John wants to bring us, all of us, and he wants to bring you, even you, into a kind of fellowship with him, into a kind of fellowship with all the apostles and their fellowship. And so through them and through that fellowship, we would be in fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So you might say, but I'm such a promising young person. And John would say, you know what you need? You need fellowship. And you might say, Oh, but I'm such a not promising young person. Nothing about me is promising. You know what John would say? He would say, brother or sister, you need fellowship. You might say, oh, but I have so many challenges in my life. John would say, you need fellowship. You might say, oh, but I fail so much. Uh, I, 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 I can never do the right thing. Everyone is always upset with me. You know, John would say, you need fellowship. This seems to be, at least in the beginning of his letter, this is the way that John opens for the churches and for the saints to go forward, is to come into this kind of fellowship with the apostles and with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship is actually something very precious and very profound. This is the second point on the outline. This is the purpose of John's writing, so that you may have fellowship with us. And I just have a few comments about the word fellowship. Fellowship is both simple and profound, personal and corporate, accessible and ever-deepening. I'll just say a couple things about those words. You know, fellowship is simple, personal, and accessible. Uh, you know, even the youngest believer Someone who has been born again for only a short time can enjoy this thing called fellowship. You don't have to be a, a, a mature believer. You don't have to be a sister who has followed the Lord for decades. 
you don't have to be a brother who's uh, somehow uh, you're, 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 you've grown and you're an elder in the church. No, you don't need to be these things to enjoy fellowship. Even the youngest believer, even the, even the, the newest believer can enjoy this thing called fellowship. Because on the one hand, it's simple, it's accessible. You can enjoy this spiritual fellowship in the morning when you wake up. You can enjoy it when you open your Bible. You can enjoy it as you eat your meals. You can enjoy it as you transport to school or to work. You can enjoy this fellowship throughout your whole day because it's so accessible within our spirits. At the same time, fellowship is profound and it's ever deepening. Uh, if you're an older Christian, you may realize, I need to go deeper. Uh, the fellowship that I have, even the fellowship I enjoy with the Father, with His Son, Jesus Christ, even with the Apostles, with John and the Apostles, my fellowship needs to go deeper. So fellowship is very, it's very incredible that way. All of us on this call can enjoy fellowship. I see that there's 39 participants. I wish I could see your faces. I wish that we were in person and we could all proclaim together, we can have fellowship. Because all of us on this call, no matter how young of a Christian you are, no matter how many things you struggle with, and how many things are challenges to your Christian life, you can have fellowship. And at the same time, on this call, there are some who have followed the Lord for many years, and you're very experienced. You know the Lord. You know spiritual things. And even you, I'm sure, would say, I need my fellowship to go deeper, to go further. I need to experience it more and experience it more fully. Some notes about fellowship. The first one is the word fellowship. Here are just some definitions that uh, word scholars, biblical word scholars give. Uh, one definition of fellowship is that it's an association involving close mutual relations and involvement. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that word close relations. It's an association involving close mutual relations. You know, if you say something, just based on this point, if you say a phrase like, I want to have fellowship with God, it's like you're saying, I want to be close with God. Or you could say, I'm in fellowship with God. And that's like saying, God is so close to me. And this is why fellowship is something so simple and so accessible. Because when we wake up in the morning and we turn our mind to our spirit, uh, when we consider God, when we consider His Word, then we can just have a sense within ourselves, God is close to me. He's close to me. God is with me. Uh, you may go to school. You may have a test. You may have an exam that day. And you may be looking at the problems, and you may even pray, God, what is the answer to this question? Has anyone ever done that? I have done that. <laughs> and then God may not give you the answer to that question. Oh, no! But, you know, you may feel, even as you don't have the answer to the question on your exam, you may feel, God would say, I'm not going to give you the answer to that question, but I'm going to give you my presence to be close with you. So, God is, can be with you even while you take your exam. Uh, God is not just a miracle worker to give you a perfect uh, mark on your exam, but God is, God is able to be with you and close to you. We, uh, we have problems and challenges, and sometimes we just, we just need to be close to God. And God does not always just answer our questions and solve our problems in the moment. But we can still enjoy being close to Him. The Apostle John even had this experience. Uh, many commentators point to the experience of the Last Supper 
when Jesus was eating with his disciples before going to the cross. And the Bible says that Jesus became deeply distressed. So he was very bothered within himself. Uh, not bothered, just very uh, pressed by what he was going to be going through. He felt the pressure coming of his experience of the cross. And uh, so he was troubled. He was troubled in his spirit. Uh, but the Bible shows us at that time that as they sat around the table, the Apostle John was just leaning upon the breast of Jesus. Uh, you know, Jesus was distressed. And then even Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. Uh, and then the apostles began looking at one another and saying, is it you? Are you going to betray Jesus? And then they began to say, the Bible is so interesting, they began to say, it's not I, is it? <laughs> so it's not, is it you, is it you? And then they said, is it me? Is it me? And will I betray? So Jesus just said a simple phrase, he was troubled, and then everyone around the table became troubled, and then in that instance, do you know what happened? Peter motioned to John to ask Jesus who he was talking about. And the Bible shows us that John was leaning upon the breast of Jesus. Just kind of leaning there. If you can imagine Jesus, John was just leaning up against him. And John asked Jesus, who are you talking about? And Jesus told him, even told him, it's who, it's who I dip the morsel of bread in and then share it with. And then he dipped the morsel of bread and gave it to Judas. But the Bible says the disciples still did not understand what Jesus was saying. It's hard to believe, but one thing that shows us is that even though John didn't, John's questions were not his, the, the troubling within Jesus and the trouble within the disciples was not solved in that moment. And even though Jesus gave an answer, John did not understand that answer. He, he still had the question, who will betray you? But even with the troubling, even with the unanswered question, John was just enjoying reclining on Jesus' breast. You know where he was? He was close to Jesus. And there may be many times you have unanswered questions, you have problems that can't be solved, but you, may, you can have a sense within, oh, I just have Jesus. I'm close to Jesus. Jesus is close to me. God is with me. You know what that is? That is one element of fellowship. You can have fellowship with God. You can be close to God. The second definition is a little bit, a little bit more. It's not just close. Another definition of fellowship is a relation between individuals which involves a common interest and a mutual active participation in that interest and in each other. So, I just want to emphasize in this point, it's not just being close to someone, it's also having a common interest in a mutual active participation in that interest and in each other. You know, fellowship also involves a letting go of our own interests and a coming to a common interest with someone else. Well, if you say, I'll just be very simple on this point, if you say, I'd like to have fellowship with God, well, that means letting go of your own personal interests and your personal ambitions and coming to the common interest that God has. Oh, well, there's a lot that could be said there. But even to say fellowship with one another, or in this case, with the Apostle John. John was writing so that his readers would have fellowship first with him and the Apostles. So in other words, those, those of us who are reading what John wrote, we would be able to open our hands, to let go of our own personal ambitions and personal interests, the things that, are, that we desire, we would be able to let that go, and we would be able to come into a common interest together with the apostles. And then John says, actually, the interest of the apostles is the same interest as the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So we enter into this realm where now it's not just Christians who all have their own individual interests and desires and goals and aims and ambitions, but actually Christians can begin to be uh, blent together 
uh, by letting go of all their personal things and coming to the common interest of God, of the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, you know, this conference, we spent four meetings on this, and I, I only have one time with all of you, so I'll try to go a little bit faster. Fellowship, I hope that we can begin to see just how precious fellowship is. In fellowship, we can say, I have God. He's close to me. And in fellowship, we can say, my interests are becoming God's interests. Or, uh, rather, God's interests are becoming my interests. They be, they're beginning to become a common interest. And not just God and me, but also others. In these verses, it's the apostles, but surely that also includes all the saints. All the saints uh, coming into a fellowship with one another, with the apostles, and with the Father and His Son. And um, so I just want to touch now, okay, if this fellowship is so great, then how do we get it? How do we come into it? How do we touch it? And John really gives us like a marvelous and simple pathway in these verses. And I'll just say a few things about that pathway. The first thing I want us, uh, I want us to see is in verse 2. At the end of verse 2, John says, We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So first of all, there is this matter of eternal life. And we know from verse 1, John is speaking of the word of life. And in verse 2, the beginning, John says the light was made manifest. You know who John is speaking about when he says these things? He's speaking about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word of life. Jesus is the eternal life manifested to us. But he starts by saying this life was with the Father. Okay, so this life, number one, was with the Father. And this is something that we won't, we won't talk about tonight in this evening meeting. But this fellowship is a matter of life. And this life was first with the Father. This fellowship is something, fellowship, divine fellowship, has its source and its origin in the triune God himself. So within the Father and Son and Spirit, there is this, there is this experience that we can call fellowship. And it's by life. This life was first with the Father. But then, praise the Lord, this life was made manifest to us. So fellowship, or life, did not just remain with the Father, but the life was manifested to John. Or I believe we could say, we all could say, this life, Jesus Christ, was made manifest to us. Somehow we see Jesus. We can know Jesus. To, you know, the Apostle John knew him in the flesh. Today, we don't know Jesus in the flesh, but we know him in spirit. In our spirit, we know him. We can touch him. And all of these things that John says in verse 1 can be our experience with the word of life. The Apostle John said uh, that he heard, he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So concerning Jesus Christ, the word of life, John and the apostles personally experienced Christ. They personally experienced the life that was manifested to them. Well, I just want to say a couple things about this. Number one, this matter of Christ as life. Uh, you know, throughout the Bible, we see that Jesus Christ is our life. He is the life of Christians. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to, to the Father except through me. So Jesus said, I am the life. 
Uh, in, in Colossians, the Apostle Paul says, when Christ, our life, appears. That's in Colossians chapter 3. So when Christ, our life, if you're a Christian, who is Christ? He is your life. Who, uh, what is your life? Or who is your life? It's Christ. Christ is our life. And then even at the end of this first epistle of John, the Apostle John said, He who has the Son of God has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So if you have the Son, if you have Jesus, you have life. <laughs> if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. Oh, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Brother John, sharing your screen. But anyways, Jesus Christ is our life. And I really like this because, you know, there's a difference between uh, knowing Christ as life and just having knowledge concerning Christ or even experiencing Christ in other ways. You know, the Bible says that God is love. And when I think of love, I often think of a kind of care that God has for us. This care is for our growth, um, because he disciplines the sons whom he loves. But this care is also like a, like a, like a warmth, uh, the warmth of a father to his son. Just like in the prodigal son story, the father just falls on his son and hugs him and welcomes him in. This is knowing God as love. But knowing Christ as life, what makes life different from love? Life is something that energizes. It, it's, it's something vital, something that, that makes us energetic. <laughs> when you're full of life, you're full of energy. Even sometimes just in the, in, in the world, when someone is uh, very energetic, or very uh, vivacious is an is a English word that we use. Sometimes people say, wow, that, that girl or that boy is full of life. That's a very lively person. And in the same way, to experience Christ as life is to experience Christ in a way that energizes us. It burdens us, fills us with feeling, fills us with sensation, fills us with a vital sense within and we can, we can be bold, we can be strong, we can be uh, uh, whatever, but we can say, I want to live for God. <laughs> and we can say that with passion and energy and vitality. Why? Because Christ is our life. Praise the Lord, the life was with the Father, was manifested to us. And then John and the apostles personally experienced Christ. They heard Christ. They saw Christ with their eyes. They looked upon Christ. And they touched him with their hands. Uh, this is uh, just very experiential. They had personal experiences of Jesus Christ. Well, in the same way, we too must have personal experiences of Jesus Christ, of the word of life. You know, handling or touching Christ, tasting Christ, experiencing Christ in a way that is living, not just knowing about Christ, not just knowing uh, the stories about Christ, but actually touching Him in our spirit in a way that makes us feel energized and vital. Well, this is what John and the other apostles experienced. They personally experienced Christ. And then the third point, John proclaimed his living experience with Christ. He said, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So according to this verse, John was not proclaiming something that he had not seen. He was not proclaiming something he had not heard. He was proclaiming only what he had seen and heard. All of his experience of Christ is what he was proclaiming. He was not proclaiming some other experience. He was not proclaiming what someone else knew. John was proclaiming what he himself had seen and heard concerning the eternal life. Uh, and then the fourth point, this sharing of his living experience of Christ 
as the word of life was sufficient to bring the believers into fellowship with John and the apostles, and through them, with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Again, this is verse 3. John says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Okay, so we're beginning to see a little bit of the flow of John's process. Number one, there was life. Life was with the Father. And then that light, number two, was manifested to John. John saw the light. He saw Jesus. Then number three, John experienced Jesus as the word of life. He saw him. He heard him. He beheld him with his eyes. He touched him with his hands. And then everything that he had personally seen and heard about this light, now he was sharing with the believers. And this sharing of his personal experiences of Christ was to bring the believers into fellowship with him. So fellowship with John and with the apostles was produced not by some organizational structure. It was not produced by some association uh, alone. It was not produced by telling them rules to do. Fellowship with John and the apostles was produced by John simply sharing with the believers his personal experiences of Jesus Christ. And in the same way today, our fellowship with one another is produced in the exact same way. Fellowship with the Father and His Son is experienced by us when we touch and taste, when we see and when we handle Jesus for ourselves. When we ourselves have personal experiences of Jesus Christ, then we are touching the light being manifested to us. So that's very good. And then fellowship is produced as we share with one another our own personal experiences of Christ. That which we have seen and heard when we proclaim to one another, we, that is sufficient to bring one another into fellowship. And that fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I wish that we were all together in person and we could really talk about this and we could have examples and we could have demonstrations. But I hope that you can at least see a little bit of how fellowship is produced by this flowing of life. Life being Christ. Life was with the Father was manifested to us, we saw it, we heard it, we experienced it, and now we proclaim it. And when we proclaim that which we have seen and heard, oh, it can bring us into fellowship with one another. So, do we see that? Do we see how that, how John simply was sharing the life he experienced, the Christ that he had experienced, that which he had seen, that which he had heard, he was proclaiming that. And that was so that the believers would have fellowship with him and with the apostles. So Brother Shim, you know, uh, when you share your personal experience of Christ with me, do you know what that does? It can bring, it's sufficient to bring me into fellowship with you. And then, when I share my personal experience of Christ with you, that is sufficient to bring you into fellowship with me. <laughs> and so, Brother Shim, you and I can have fellowship together. And then that fellowship can be with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, Brother Shim, is our fellowship simply because we're on the same Zoom call together right now, in this moment? You have to say, no! <laughs> fellowship is not just a Zoom call. Fellowship is not a matter of just having our screen, our faces on the screen together. That's not fellowship. The fellowship is when, the, is when we can share our experiences of Christ with one another. Then that is sufficient to bring us into fellowship together. And that fellowship then with the apostles and fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, Brother Shim, isn't that wonderful? Right now, you're across the world in the Philippines. 
and uh, I'm here in the United States. We're exactly 12 hours apart. That means you're exactly on the other side of the world from me. Can you believe it? And you know what? We can have fellowship with one another. And then you, someone might say, oh, what a marvel that is that technology can link you together today. And I would say, yes, that is a marvel, but it's not the technology that makes the fellowship. <laughs> the technology only makes a way for us to communicate. But then it's the communication, it's the sharing with one another of our personal experiences of Christ. Now, that is enough to bring us into fellowship together. So, even Jonathan is in Canada, and I'm in the United States, and the rest of you, I believe, are in the Philippines. All around the world, here we are on this call. We're not in fellowship because of being on this call. We're in fellowship because there can be a sharing of the life of Christ among us. And that shared by sharing with one another our personal experiences of this Christ. And as we share the Christ that we have seen, the Christ that we have heard with one another, oh, praise the Lord, we're, we come into a fellowship together. And that fellowship is with the Father and the Son as well. So I want to end by reading this last paragraph here. The divine fellowship is not produced by outward arrangements. I hope that we can see that. It's not by outward arrangements, by formal organization, by close associations, or by charismatic leaders. No! Fellowship, <laughs> fellowship is not produced just by being friends with someone, by saying, oh, I grew up in the church with this person. We're in fellowship. No, fellowship is not is not just having close associations. And fellowship is not even following a charismatic leader together. Just because there might be a charismatic leader, uh, okay, uh, leadership is not bad. A charismatic leader is not wrong. But it's not a leader who makes fellowship. It's not like everyone who follows a leader is in fellowship and, no, and others are not. No. Fellowship is not defined by a charismatic leader. No! True fellowship is organic, produced by experiencing Jesus Christ as life and sharing what we have experienced of Christ with one another. Okay, so older believers can experience Christ. Do you believe that? Do you saints believe that older believers can experience Christ? Someone can say, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you know, Amen. even younger believers can experience Christ. Do you believe it? Amen. 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 Even the newest believer can experience Christ. Do you believe it? Amen. 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 Hey, brother, sister, even you can experience Christ. You believe it? Amen. 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 That's right. Even you can experience yeah. Christ. And then when you ex when you share with one another your experience of Christ, then you you are brought together into this fellowship, this divine fellowship, a sharing of life, a fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So us. Look at this sentence, I like it. Young and be in fellowship with old. Can you believe it? How can a person be in fellowship with an older person? It's not because of age. It's not because of arrangements. It's not because of any formal organization. Young can be in divine fellowship with old because the young can share their experience of Christ with the older ones. And the older ones can share their experience of Christ with the younger one. And as they share their experience of Christ together, young can be in fellowship with old. Praise the Lord. And old with young. Husbands with wives. Wow. Those of us who are married, can you believe it? Husbands can be in fellowship with wives. 
How? And just because of, because someone said, Amen. <laughs> Is it just because of a formal arrangement called marriage? No, that's precious, honorable. We ought to honor that to the utmost. But marriage does not equal fellowship. This fellowship comes when a husband can share their experience of Christ with their wife. And a wife can share her experience of Christ with her husband. And so husbands and wives can be in fellowship together with the Father and His Son, Jesus. Even children with parents. How? Because children, those of us who are younger on this call, even you can, even we can experience Christ. And when we share our experiences of Christ with our parents, then that, that is, that's enough to bring our parents into fellowship with us. Can you believe it? Even those of us who have children, Brother Shim, I know you have children. Do you believe that your children can bring you into fellowship? <laughs> but it's, if your children experience Christ, and if they share that experience with you, oh, that is sufficient to bring you into fellowship with them. So children can have fellowship with parents, and parents can have fellowship with their children. And then saints with one another, and even churches with one another. Can you believe it? Saints with one another, and even churches with one another. All in fellowship with the Father and with His Son. You know, many of us on this call tonight are from different local churches. Do you know how churches can be in fellowship together? Is it just some outward organization where we all are on a Zoom call together? No, that's just an organization. The real fellowship comes when even among churches, between churches, there can be a sharing of Christ as light, uh, an experiencing of Christ as light, and then that experience is shared even from church to church. And so churches can even be brought into fellowship together, and that fellowship is still with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's something not formal, it's not outward, it's not by man's arrangements. This kind of fellowship is something organic, something energizing, something vital, something of Christ Himself, and communicating Christ Himself with one another. I'd like to just finish sharing, uh, reading this paragraph. All in fellowship with the Father and with His Son. How? By sharing with one another their living experiences of Christ. Thus, together, we can be close to God. That's one definition of fellowship. Close to God. And together we can lay aside our own interests to be for the common interests of God. And specifically in these verses, it's the interest of the Father, the interest of the Son, and the interest of the Apostles. We can lay aside together all of our own interests and be for the common interest of the Apostles, of the Father, and of His Son. Hallelujah! What a fellowship of life. And I think, I think as we speak about this and talk about this, I think you can see why the Apostle John wrote verse 4. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete, or our joy may be made full. You know, for the Apostle John, if the believers could come into such a fellowship together with him and with God, oh, what a joy this fellowship is. And so too with us. If we can come into such a fellowship together, what a joy for us. So coming all the way back to the beginning, you may feel like you're a hopeful brother, full of promise for God. <laughs> you know what you need? You need fellowship. You need saints to share their experiences of Christ with you. And you need to share your experience of Christ with others to produce such a joyful fellowship. Or you may be a brother or a sister who has many challenges in your life. You may, your, your living might be full of all kinds of bad habits. 
of things that prevent you from growing spiritually, of things that even prevent you from being a healthy human being. You know what you need? You need fellowship. <laughs> you need other brothers and sisters to come and share with you what their experiences of Christ are. And then as you're brought into this fellowship with them, oh, now suddenly you have fellowship with God and with the apostles. And God is close to you. And your interests are becoming what God is interested in. And you have joy. <laughs> the joy is made complete. You may wonder, how could my life change? How could my living change? Or you may wonder, how could the life of someone that I know be changed? There may be a brother in your church. You may wonder, how could his life be changed? You know how? By bringing him or by bringing a sister into fellowship. By going to them, sharing with them your personal experiences of Christ. How have you heard him this week? How have you seen him this week? How have you handled him this week? How have you touched him this week? How has he touched you this week? As we share these things with one another, oh, we're brought into fellowship. And this fellowship uh, makes our joy full, fills us with joy, fills our church life with joy. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for this fellowship. The, the flowing of life from the Father all the way to us. And praise the Lord, we can come into this fellowship together and our joy can be made full. So, amen. I think I will end. I'll stop there. <laughs> wow. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure what you saints usually do now. Do you um, do you want to have some testimony or just some prayers to close our time? Yeah, that is why we have this joy, especially when we have our conferences, when we have activities. Uh, we have to worry that uh, uh, after the fellowship or even seeing our brothers and sisters, you guys. Yeah, it's more than uh, it's more than the joy of seeing the love of Because that life will us us uh, that 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 is within us. That produces not the joy in our relationship. So like for this one, we see our brothers there, others from club uh uh not open the camera, but uh we need to you want to a joy. You just tell my children that you have this feeling. You have this fulfillment. You have this satisfaction in our inside, in our inner part of our business. Thank you, Father. So, actually, that question to be clear, why is it that we don't in every 